Well, that little video, for those of you that may remember, about uh, a month ago now, might have been five weeks ago, uh, we gave everyone an opportunity following service to visit the new wings on the building that we have constructed and are now just like that far away from being completed. Yay. And uh, pray for final steps, uh, and uh, we'll just let it go with that. But uh, this was a day in which we invited the congregation simply to visit the wings as they existed at that time and record on the bare concrete floor scripture verses, prayer requests, dreams of ministry that we would have that uh, these two new additions to this particular facility would be used of God to continue to spread his word, to advance his kingdom, to provide opportunities to change lives. And uh, what you saw in the video is just a very small excerpt from that. We had so many pictures taken that day um, that uh, there's just no way that we, well, we could have incorporated them in, but you'd be sitting here probably until uh, the roast was burned this afternoon to, uh, to see all those. Um, but we are going to make, be making all those available. We're making an extended uh, video available, and Shannon's going to be putting it up on a, a digital picture the visual, what do you call it? Visual picture frame in the hall, and we're also going to have those ready for the grand opening just as a reflection. And of course now all of those prayer requests are, um, uh, are covered up with the tile that went on top of them. And you may say, well, why'd you cover them up? Well, practically speaking, we probably figured the floors should be tiled. Uh, yeah. But understand this. Don't view those tiles as hiding the prayers. View those tiles as protecting those prayers, those verses, those dreams, those hopes, those aspirations now lay underneath that tile, and they're not going anywhere. And the one person, even if you forget what you wrote on that particular day, God knows. And view that as a constant petition, a constant request for what God would do through these new buildings. Now, all that said, we know and we say often, we know the church is not a building. We know that there are church buildings, but church fundamentally at its core is not a building. We often refer to the building in which we meet and do other types of ministry uh, as the church, uh, particularly when the fire alarm goes off at 5 in the morning and they call the pastor or the lay leader or somebody and, you know, because some weird thing has tripped it, I say, and we'll stagger out of bed and say to our spouse, i got to go to the church. Okay? You know, they're not sitting there thinking... Who's at the church at 5 in the morning? And they know I'm going to the building. We often will call the building the church, but we know fundamentally this facility is not the church. It's just the building that we happen to set aside for a particular purpose. So what is the church? What's the real church? And most importantly, how can we keep it real in this context? We have been going through a little series of worship themes the last few weeks, simply called Keeping It Real, where we've looked at a variety of areas of life, certainly not the totality of life's experiences, but at least a few in which we simply ask the question, how does God fit into that in a real way? Not just uh, through some uh, cliche formulas, but how can God fit? We, we've addressed this in terms of our marriages, we've addressed it in terms of our workplaces and our time, talked about how to keep real with God, and I think today it's a very honest question to say, how do we keep it real in church? You know, it's very easy to label something church and not really experience what God intended for that to be. You know, we can label it and we can go through the motions and we can do all the religious activities and never really experience what God really intended for us to experience in a real tangible way at a personal level and a corporate level, what God really wanted us to experience when it comes to church. And so this morning, at least for a few minutes, I'd like to visit with you what God has to say about that issue and at least help us think a bit how we can be what God always intended us to be so that church, whether it be at Harvester or any other congregation in God's fellowship can truly experience and be what God wants them to be and, and not allow all the other stuff that kind of comes with it to get in the way. Things like, well, buildings, <laughs> budgets, and all these things that go into doing it. I think it's important for us to look more deeply at the core of what God says a church is. 
And to do that, we're going to look at least at one really, really important passage of Scripture that, uh, that God lays down for us His desires and His intention for what church should be. It's in the book of Ephesians. And allow me to read these words. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, there are other places in the scriptures where the church is described. And there are different analogies used in the Bible to describe the church. For example, for example, sometimes the church is compared to a building and that we are the building blocks of the kingdom, you and I, with Christ Jesus being the keystone of the structure. We are also referred to in the Bible as the bride of Christ and all the implications of how a bride deserves and ought to be treated and is treated by her betrothed. In our case, we're betrothed to Jesus Christ. And it tells us something of the love and devotion and the commitment that Christ has made to his people, even in the midst of our incredible lack of perfection, and sometimes even in the midst of times when we doubt his love for us. He still loves us. Um, in this particular passage, we have a description of the church from a functional standpoint. How is the church supposed to work? Now, a couple of preliminary observations about what this passage says about that, and then I'd like to talk about, very briefly, what does it take to see that this picture of the church, this God-ordained description of what he desires the church to be, becomes what he expects it to be. First observation is this. First observation is this. God's intention for the church is that it be centered and focused on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I think that's a no-brainer. It is amazing to me sometimes, though, how often we forget that simple little truth. That we think it's about all kinds of other stuff. That the focus of the church is to be on the person and work of Jesus Christ the passage makes it clear that this thing that he calls church with all the gifts and all the people and all the purpose and all that, at the core of it, he is its head. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Therefore, our cues for what we need to be, what we need to become, what we need to be doing should be coming from what we know to be true of Jesus and what he has asked us to do on this earth. It's very, very important that we keep coming back to that. This defines, and this is the mission and, and purpose of the church, is to be focused on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. When I say the person of Jesus Christ, this is where we have opportunity to praise and be thankful for all that he's done on our behalf. We talk about the work of Jesus Christ. Well, that's the part that comes after. Because after Jesus had ascended into heaven, we're told that he distributed gifts in order that we might carry on his work. And so the church is defined not by a group of people who comes together 
and bears witness to and is thankful for what Jesus has done for us, but a group of people through which the work of Christ continues to move forward in the lives of others. That's pretty core to understanding what the church is. The other little observation I would like to make about this is, you know, not to be defensive here, but the pastor of the church is not the person who is hired to do the ministry of the church. Now, that should be true in any congregation. Now, what does that mean? That the pastor just gets to just do nothing? <laughs> no. Pastors have an incredibly important role. And that role, primarily according to this particular passage, is not to be the hired hand. They are hired, and we're thankful to you all. I have the opportunity to be paid to be here on weekends. I realize that's an incredible privilege. My job description isn't simply to do what the church needs to do. It's to, in some way, shape, or form, influence and equip the body as a whole to do the work of the ministry. The body of the whole to do the work of the ministry. And so the role of pastors and leaders in the church is to give leadership, guidance, direction, and equip. But the ministry of the church is something we all do together. The ministry of the church is something we all do together. Now, with that in mind, let me just mention a couple of things that I think are implied here that can get in the way of us really experiencing that. I'd rather really state them positively rather than negatively. We could talk about when these things are not present, why the work of the church, and why we don't experience church the way that we would love to and like to, but let's state them positively. First thing, we have to have a fundamental basic commitment to our mission. I mentioned that our mission is all involved in the person and work of Jesus Christ, and that mission is to better enable each of us to grow up and become mature in Christ. In other words, that's why we're here. Now, in order to do that, there's a lot of other things that need to get done. I understand that. But if we forget the reason for which we're doing it, then all that other stuff suddenly begins to define what church is. And it also begins to lose its meaning and its significance when we begin to forget why we're here in the begin with. And that's to enable people to experience Christ in a personal way and to see that relationship grow and deepen over a lifetime. You see, the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ is a, is a lifetime learning adventure. There never comes a point this side of heaven where we cease to have growth areas and opportunities to experience God in ways that are both deeper and broader than maybe we have to that point in time. And that's what we're there to assist each other in the prophets. And when we lose sight of that, well, we begin to redefine ourselves as something other than that great work that God has called us to. The other thing that I will suggest that this passage implies that needs to happen for us to experience church the way the passage describes it is not only a, a deep-rooted commitment to our mission and to our purpose, but a deep-rooted and committed, uh, deep-rooted commitment to one another. You see, it's not just what we do, but it's how we go about doing it that this passage tells us is so important. This passage tells us that each and every person in the body of Christ has value and gifting that can contribute to the health and well-being and ministry of the church. It is not a collection of individuals doing their own thing. It is a congregation of people inextricably linked to one another by virtue of their common relationship with Jesus Christ, doing the work of Christ together. Now, granted, we all, according to this passage, have different gifts and competencies and abilities to do that. I have a certain set of gifts. I've got a couple, I think, according to the Bible. <laughs> but so do you. And God intends for those gifts to be used in concert, not in isolation. <clears throat> and so the other thing that it takes for us to realize and experience church this way is not just a commitment to the mission and the work that he's given us, but a commitment to that doing that mission and doing that work together. Together. A sense of community. Where it's not fragmented into a sea of, say, islands. This is what we do together. 
And one of the challenges, I think, for any church is to work through that because i got news for you. Some of us don't rub people the right way. It we're just personalities are different. Ideas are different. And the reality is everybody's always not going to agree with one another. But that's not the issue. The issue is how we handle it when we don't agree with one another. And we're willing to pray that through, work that through, till we can come to the point where we can mutually agree to do the work of the church. And that we don't opt out simply because everything at the church isn't measuring up to my personal satisfaction. Why? Because fundamentally we're committed to the mission, the person and work of Jesus Christ, and we're committed to doing that. Yeah. And then the third thing I would say is this. In order for us to experience church this way, we need a fundamental core commitment to our mission, to our purpose, to why we're doing it in the first place. We need a fundamental core commitment to doing it together. But then, to make it real at the personal level, we need a fundamental core commitment to my specific, our specific role within that. You see, the passage tells us, as I mentioned, we each have a specific gift. Unwrapped, unused gifts are something that hold the church back. You know, when my kids, and now my grandkids, on Christmas morning open presents, I can guarantee you there is not an unwrapped gift left under the tree. It is exciting to receive and know I have a gift. Folks, you have a gift. Don't leave it unwrapped and sitting under the tree. It blesses no one that way. In fact, it's going to look kind of weird come about June. When people come into your home or come into your church, says, what's that over there? So oh, it's a gift we didn't open. Well, why didn't you open it? I don't know. Didn't want to. I don't know. Ran out of time. I know. A lot of reasons. Folks, you have a gift. Scared. Scared. <laughs> but you have a gift. And you say, I know I do. I need help finding it. We can help you with that too. But it takes a fundamental commitment, and this was where it becomes personal, to each of us playing our particular role in the life and the ministry of the church. And so I would say to you, for us to experience this as the way God wants us to experience it, we need to, though, we need to basically see these three commitments as important. A basic commitment to our mission, to our work, to why we're here. A basic commitment to fulfilling that mission together. And a fundamental basic commitment to fulfilling my specific role. To exercising my specific gift in that context. Then what happens? The Bible says, if we will do that, if we will do that, if we will agree to those basic commitments, God will help us put it together. It's interesting. The commitment comes before the realization. You see, that's the problem. Some of us won't commit to it until we know that it's going to be the way we expect it to be. It doesn't work like that with God. God says, you commit to the church and then allow me to show you how it's all going to fit together. And he says, if you will do that, you will grow closer to me, you will grow closer to one another, you experience health and growing and love in ways that you have never experienced it before on God's earth. That's what he wants you to experience in his church. And you will not be tempted and tossed by other options. You will begin to realize that the church is the place where you can experience all that God wanted us to. And then all the other options that scream to say this can fulfill you, that can fulfill you, that, that we may be tempted to explore other teachings that would tell you that no, Jesus really isn't the answer. We won't be, we won't be abandoned to those. Because we'll be experiencing it for real in the context. A couple of weeks ago, the youth group uh, had a mission weekend, and part of them went to uh, Metropolitan Ministries, and the other half uh, did some uh, landscaping work around the church parsonage. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yesterday, um, they, they got most of that done. There's a little section that, that the mulch we didn't have time to complete, so we had some more mulch done. So, so yesterday, I had my grandkids over, and I said, we're going to go mulch. They said, great, what's mulch? <laughs> to find out. So this was a little interesting. Why did I need them to throw mulch? Well, here's the thing. 
Um, I didn't know this, but uh, someone was helping landscaping said, you know that black stuff you put under the mulch so the weeds don't grow back through? They said, you don't need to buy that. You can just use newspaper, of which we all have abundance. It's a very perfect recycling opportunity. Problem with newspaper, you put it on the ground, it tends to get blown up by the slightest little breeze. <laughs> and I said, I have a solution for this. It's my little grandkids' feet that I can lay the newspaper down and they can just stand on the newspaper and I can pour the mulch in behind it. Doesn't have to be blown away. Doesn't have to be blown up. And you see, that's what the church tends to become when we don't exercise these fundamental commitments. The least little breeze can blow us off course. But it can't and won't if we're committed to our mission if we are committed to doing the mission together, and if each of our are committed to exercising our particular role in gifting, to see if that would happen. But, Father, thank you for this incredible description of your church. We, we thank you for the work that you want to do through us. And, Father, we thank you that, Lord, we don't always have to struggle in defining who we are and why we're here. You've prescribed it for us. Granted, it's an adventure to figure out how to do that, and we always have to be asking it in context of the particular community and the place and age in which we live. But we have a rock solid promise on from you here that we can and we will do that by your grace. Help us to keep it real in your church. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.